So now I'm pleased to introduce uh, Ariane Brennert, who um, is going to talk to us about medical and surgical management of non-echolasia motility disorder. Uh, Ariane is a consultant gastroenterologist at the Amsterdam University Medical Center and professor of neurogastroenterology and motility at the University of Amsterdam. His main focus, as you all know, has been on esophagus, uh, echolasia, reflux disease, and eosinophilic esophagitis. He's one of the pioneers of high-resolution manometry and impedance monitoring. He has over 250 publications and book chapters, and he's currently the president of the European Society of Eosinophilic Esophagitis and member of the UEG Scientific Committee. Uh, we have heard Ariane uh, at various societies and discussions. We're pleased that He's here today to tell us about what to do medically or surgically to some of these difficult motility disorders. Ariane, welcome. Thank you for that very kind introduction. And I'll um, start now. Here's my disclosures. And um, the, for the next 20 minutes or so, I will uh, discuss the non achalasia spastic disorders, the hypomotility disorders, and the ETA outflow obstruction as far as it's not induced by opioids. And I'll start with the non achalasia spastic disorders. And um, in the recent version of the Chicago classification, that's the, uh, version 4.0, uh, distal esophageal spasm is defined as more than uh, two out of 10 swallows with premature contractions. Now, we define a premature contraction as the following. If you look at this um, swallow, you can see the relaxation of the upper esophageal sphincter. This is where we say the swallow will start, then the peristaltic wave. And at a certain point, the peristaltic wave will decelerate in the proximal, uh, in the distal esophagus. And that's called the contractile deceleration point. Now, the time between the start of the swallow and the contractile deceleration point is the distal latency. And normally, this is more than four and a half seconds. If the distal latency is short, we call it a premature contraction. And this is seen in patients with distal esophageal spasm. So in contrast to the previous versions of the Chicago classification, we do not consider the contractile front velocity to be relevant anymore. And um, this follows from a study from John Pandolfino, where he looked at patients with potential spasm and he evaluated those with a rapid contraction, so a fast contractile front velocity, and those with a low distal latency. And what they found is that the patients with rapid contraction velocity are quite a heterogeneous group in symptoms and diagnosis. And those with a short distal latency all have dysphagia and all have a compatible profile with uh, DES and echelasia type 3. So the distal esophageal spasms are solely based on the distal latency and not on the contractile front velocity. So if you look at these four examples, only the one in the left upper corner has a distal latency of less than four and a half seconds. Only that one has spasm. The other ones are not considered spasm anymore. Another um, hypercontractile condition are the hypercontractile disorders. This is um, defined here as more than two out of 10 swallows with hypercontractility. So what is hypercontractility? This is when the distal contraction integral is more than 8,000. Sometimes the lower esophageal sphincter is involved in the hypercontractility. And um, if you would only measure the DCI above the ETJ, you would not register this. So from um, the previous version of the um, classification, the ETJ is involved in the DCI box as well. And so if it's more than 8,000, you have a hypercontractile contraction. And if you have two or more of these, we would say this is a hypercontractile esophagus, or sometimes jackhammer esophagus. Sometimes people refer to this as a nutcracker as well. This is the, basically what was used in the classifications with conventional manometry. Now, sometimes the relationship between symptoms and hypercontractility is not so certain. So you can have chest pain and dysphagia caused by the hypercontractile esophagus, but sometimes um, you have a patient with more functional symptoms 
you may find the hypercontractal esophagus incidental. So this is a difficult, very difficult clinically sometimes. So here's a, again the examples. On the left, you see a normal esophagus. In the middle, a, a hypercontractal esophagus, but with a normal morphology. And on the uh, right, a, a real hypercontractal contraction with repetitive contraction. And this one is also premature. So this is a combination of spasm and hypercontractility. And so on this one, it is more likely that it really causes a symptom than the one in the middle. What are the therapies for the hypercontractal disorders and DES? And I take them together because that treatment um, is very similar. So I'll just, just go through these, the calcium channel antagonists, nitrates, phosphodiesterase inhibitors, Botox, and the antidepressants. And I'll start with um, calcium channel antagonists. And you could see that most of the studies I will show you are quite old studies. There's really a demand for um, new studies, particularly uh, studies with uh, SHEM or placebo control, because most of the studies were done with conventional manometry. Here's 22 nutcracker patients received DILTSM, and um, you can see that it has an effect on the pressure amplitude in the distal esophagus, although it is a modest effect. And you can see that there's also a reduction of uh, chest pain, but no reduction of dysphagia, strangely enough. Here's a Again, a really old case report of use of nitroglycerin in a patient with DES. It reduced the amplitude of spasms and it reduced chest pain. Currently, it's, we use more often the sublingual nitrates. But again, there's no recent study to unambiguously show that this really works. What's the effect of sildenafil on esophageal motor function? Here's a study that combines data from healthy subjects and patients. You can see here in, in the six healthy controls, you can see that there is no effect 20 centimeters above the LES, but there is an effect in the distal esophagus five centimeters above the lower esophageal sphincter with sildenafil reducing contraction amplitude. And in patients with DES, um, some of the patients will have symptom relief, but others will have side effects. And um, this is a, a bit of expensive drug used off label sometimes and uh, not really often for this reason. What about Trazodon? This is a 5-HT antagonist, can be used in low dosages. There's a bit of a mixed um, response on esophageal contractility of Trazodon. And um, what you can see is that esophageal symptom distress is in this study is um, improved with Trazodon. And likewise, is chest pain intensity and frequency, but only to a small degree. So it's not that effective. And there are no effects on dysphagia. So the effects are a bit mixed here and not really encouraging. So medical treatment of hypercontractility and DES, there, there's, I think, limited evidence for calcium blockers, nitrate, sildenafil, and prazodon. It may be worth trying, but don't get your hopes up too much. What are the alternatives? Well, maybe Botox injections. We already heard about it. This is um, results from a sham controlled uh, study in uh, only 22 patients with a crossover at one month. There was a significant effect of Botox on dysphagia and it also stopped weight loss and there decreased in ETJ pressure. You can also see that there was an um, effect on dysphagia seen in the patients treated with Botox and not in the sham. So this is encouraging. But then there was another more recent study with Botox, also shim controlled, uh, similar number of patients. And then in this study, they found a significant improvement for both Botox and shim. And at 12 months improvement in all patients was seen. And this was not related to Botox treatment. So it suggests that there's a, a generally good prognosis and the symptoms related to hypercontractal disorders might prove spontaneous with time. What about a uh, poem in these conditions? Well, there's some data, but it is retrospective. Um, a very large group of patients with hypercontractal esophagus, DES and type three achalasia, retrospectively um, done, no control group, and unclear if patients had medical treatment first. Well, as expected, the poem has a very profound effect on esophageal contractility. As you can see the contractility 
really disappears. And you see that also uh, symptoms improve after poem, but again, this is without any control group and you may expect that there's a substantial uh, effect of placebo here. It's a quite invasive treatment. So I'll now move to the hypermotility disorders. And, and they are defined here by the classification as absent contractility, where there's 100% filled peristalsis. And you can distinguish this from the ineffective esophageal motility, where there is some peristalsis, but it is ineffective or frequently filled. So here are some examples. Filled is when the DCI is less than 100. As, as individual swallow is weak when the DCI is between 100 and 450, and it's fragmented when there's a large break. We say that the diagnosis is ineffective esophageal motility when there's more than 70% weak or fragmented or more than 50% filled. Absent contractility, as said, is 100% filled. Now, what are the symptoms of these conditions? Um, what you expect would be dysphagia, but sometimes the relationship with symptoms is not clear. And you may find an ineffective esophageal motility uh, in a patient with reflux disease that has no symptoms of dysphagia at all. They only have reflux symptoms. Now, um, why did we define fragmented contractions um, with this cut over five centimeters? This is uh, mainly from this study from Sabine Roman, where um, the five centimeter break um, was uh, more likely to occur um, in patients with an incomplete bolus transit on impedance. And um, it was more often seen in those subjects with dysphagia. So it looks um, a um, logical choice, but here, if you look at this study, um, they've seen that the breaks are actually quite common in healthy controls as well. And of course, in patients in GERD where you expect it. But so it's not really abnormal to have a large break as seen here. And uh, we did this study where we asked patients to swallow um, a bit of barium and then uh, correlated this to the break size of the monometry of that same swallow. Now, if there would be a very good relationship between break size and uh, passage or stasis of the liquid barium swallow, you would expect um, no stasis when there is a small break size and complete stasis when the break size is very large. And so a diagonal line here from the left lower corner to the right upper corner, well, that's clearly not the case. We repeated this with solid, solid barium cubes and you could see a similar pattern. So the correlation is really, really weak. Also patients with a large break have no stasis and sometimes patients with a small break do have stasis of um, these solid barium cubes. So the relationship between break size and stasis is poor. How do you treat these hypocontractal uh, motility? Well, the obvious choice would be prokinetics. We performed a study where we gave patients brucalipride and uh, tested the effect on esophageal motility. You can see here the um, effect of um, LES pressure is not present and so is an, an effect on esophageal contractility. So basically brucalipride doesn't change esophageal contractility, although it does change um gastric motility. And there's similar data for other prokinetics such as tigacerol, cisopride, no effects on esophageal contractions. These drugs may work for reflux disease and gastric emptying problems, but they do not improve esophageal contractility. And now I'm coming to the final part here, ETJ outflow obstruction. And so we've already heard that um, Esophagogastric outflow obstruction is a problem of LES disrelaxation in combination with preserved peristalsis. This is how it was classified uh, in Chicago 3. It is a type, uh, sometimes considered a type 4 achalasia, and the question is what kind of symptoms would it result in? Dysphagia? Well, here's a study of long term follow up of a uh, group of patients with ETJ outflow obstruction. Now the majority of patients with an ETJ outflow obstruction as defined in Chicago 3, no treatment was required because they had symptoms deemed to be unrelated to outflow obstruction because they had symptom, uh, spontaneous symptom relief or sometimes they just declined therapy because 
the symptoms were not severe. Only a minority was treated here. They either received Botox injections, but gave a good but short-lived effect, or pneumatic dilation, which was a bit less successful, although the numbers are really small. And three out of 34 patients were diagnosed with achalasia on a subsequent high-resolution monotony six to 12 months later. Of course, we wanted to know if there were certain predictors of progression to achalasia. And, and um, Unfortunately, we couldn't find any. There were no predictors and symptoms in monometric um, char characteristics, barium swallow. We couldn't find any for long-term achalasia development and also no predictors for treatment success of the EGI outflow obstruction initially. So um, in that, with the Chicago 3, over 10% of all patients that underwent high resolution monometry, they have a high IRP and a preserved peristalsis. And so they were classified as an EGI outflow obstruction. And these patients undergo HRM for a reason. So they always have symptoms. They always have some kind of symptom. They won't undergo the test um, for nothing. And so a diagnosis of an EGI outflow obstruction often led to a cascade of treatments ending in sometimes a myotomy or a poem. And so in the Chicago 4 discussions, we realized that maybe um, we should change this. And the question was, is each the outflow obstruction a final diagnosis at all or merely a diagnostic a manometric finding and a risk factor for achalasia development at the longer term? So we needed to restrict the EGI outflow obstruction diagnosis. And so we did the following. And in the Chicago 3, the elevated median IRP was already sufficient to have a diagnosis of EGI outflow obstruction. In Chicago 4, it needs to be present both to pine and upright. That already eliminates a lot of false positive diagnosis. Then there's other criteria being added. The elevated intrabolus pressure, uh, the presence of relevant symptoms, such as dysphagia and chest pain, and either an abnormal time barium esophagram or endoflip is required. So additional testing is required to confirm that this is really a disorder and not just a merely a manometric finding. And only then there's a conclusive diagnosis of EGJ outflow obstruction. Now, how do you manage it? Um, at first you should regard it as a manometric finding, not as a certain diagnosis. It often has unclear clinical significance Many have no symptoms that can be explained by outflow obstruction and symptoms disappear spontaneously in others. But on the other hand, 10% will develop complete achalasia within a year. So what you can do in, in those patients that have severe symptoms and um, are willing to undergo treatment, I think Botox injections are really a good option. And in case of doubt, you could repeat high resolution monotony after six to 12 months and see if it has progressed to echelation and then offer more permanent treatments. With Botox injections, you will not um, influence that diagnostics um, after such a time. So I'll now come to the conclusions here of the medical surgical management of the non echelation spastic and hypomotility disorders before any treatment evaluate whether the manometric finding is indeed the cause of the symptom. That's crucial. You always have to ask yourself the question, could the symptom also be functional and the manometric finding incidental? In case of doubt, gain time with medical treatment or Botox and avoid invasive treatments. And you, you can always repeat testing in six to 12 months if that's really required. And um, this like to thank you for listening and I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you, Ariane. We appreciate that presentation. For everyone listening, please uh, po uh, post your questions uh, and uh, we will get to them. We now have uh, quite a, a lot of time for Q&A, which is good because uh, we're gonna put our speakers to task and give us some uh, input on how to manage this. Before I do that, I wanted to share with you the fact that this is really, uh, uh, ISD has done a great job on this uh, type of, uh, 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 lecture series. We have 127 that were registered and 39 countries are represented. And among that, the top countries, uh, as far as the numbers, US, UK, India, Australia, and Malaysia. So again, I welcome you all again. And I really uh, encourage you to take this opportunity to ask questions from our experts. Aryan, thank you again.
So some questions, uh, if I may, as questions come in, um, about the spastic disorder, you didn't mention about, um, in fact, this applies to hypomotility as well, role of PPIs. Do we treat patients based on that or do we um, treat based on symptoms and not necessarily manometry? Where do you stand on that, Ariane? Um, what do you mean in treating dysphagia or... Or yeah, let's say we do manometry and the patient has spasm. In the past with the old classification, it was suggested that uh, yeah. if there's spasm, you know, reflux could be a causal link. That's why you should treat them initially. Yeah, well, that's, a, that's a excellent, um, uh, excellent remark. So indeed, uh, spasm can be triggered by reflux. And so that's the first thing you need, would need to treat is reflux disease. Find if there's reasons for um, arguments to to conclude that there is reflux disease underlying it and then treat it. Now, um, the reason I, I didn't stress it, maybe I didn't stress it enough, but is that 99% uh, of the patients that present to us uh, with these conditions, they have already been treated extensively with PPIs. That's right. That's right. That's exactly right. So uh, I agree with you and that's part of my armamentarium as well if they hadn't been treated, but yet as you suggest, by the time they come see us for manometry, most have already tried it. Along that line, if I could uh, pose this to you and then have Dan uh, respond to it as well, what about role of dilation in either the spasm, EGJ outflow obstruction, or motility, hypomotility? And by that, I don't mean pneumatic dilation. I'm talking about just regular Maloney or Savory or um, balloon dilation of either the esophagus or EGJ. Do you do that? Are there data on that? Yeah, so I, I know um, uh, this is more popular in the US than it is in Europe. Um, I, I personally occasionally uh, do um, uh, do an empiric dilation in a patient with, particularly if they have a food bolus of infection. Now, uh, it, I, I had a look at the literature a while ago and there's really no evidence to suggest that this is helpful, but I, I still have the idea that when the patient has uh, regular food bolus infections and may have missed um, a very discreet um, relative uh, narrowing of the esophagus. But it is something that you could do, but yeah, there's no evidence to, to support you. Yeah. Dan, what do, what do you think? Uh, if you're unmuted um, uh, in any of these conditions, do you use that in addition to the therapies that Aryan has already talked about? Yeah, I think uh, in this uh, non echolasia motility disorder, particularly spastic or even hypermotility, because our treatment, our medical treatment options are so limited, and there's not a good tri uh, you know, triage of medications uh, at our disposal, if dysphagia is a prominent sim symptom, I do tend to do empiric dilation to see if they improve because uh, I'm going to do an endoscopy on them anyway, so it doesn't add much in terms of my procedure. And obviously, you know, the risk of empiric dilation are fairly minimal overall in terms of perforation. And um, in, in the studies looking at empiric dilation for dysphagia, obviously there are some studies that show maybe uh, two thirds get better in terms of dysphagia. And obviously they didn't have motility studies to see if they have underlying motility issues. But I think I've had good success uh, in that group of people without uh, subjecting them to an invasive myotomy, you know? Yeah, thank you, Dan. And if, uh, I, I was going to say one last thing. If, if nothing, it might buy us time. And then, uh, like Aryan mentioned, uh, a lot of them might resolve over a uh, year, to, year to three years, you know, in terms of their symptoms, naturally. Yeah, yeah we so performed... Um, yourself, essentially, by doing something. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> yeah. yeah we, we performed a study in, in the patients with chronic dysphagia after fund application. And they often have uh, manometrically an EGI outflow obstruction, although it's not a primary EGI outflow obstruction, but secondary to the fund application. And um, we did pneumatic dilations in, the, well, we randomized to pneumatic dilation or sham dilation. And so the effect of the pneumatic dilation was um, symptom improvement in 35% of the patients. The effect of sham was 42%. <laughs> Yeah, you can argue that the sham effect is also um, a good effect. Important effect, I agree. Um, so there was another question, Ariane, to you about 
What about doing pneumatic dilation for EGJ outflow obstruction? Um, this really gets to a question I was going to, this, this is before Botox. So they're questioning, should we do pneumatic before Botox? Um, is that something you recommend? Well, I wouldn't necessarily recommend that. The, um, so if I have a patient with EGJ outflow obstruction, I, I am in, I'm, I think that with a, a sensible um, approach is to be in doubt if the dysphagia or the chest pain is the result of what you see on the manometry. And so what I, uh, if that this is um, a developing achalasia, I know that I will catch it in six to 12 months. If, if I see an achalasia on manometry, I'm 100% sure that it, that their symptom is the result of the, mon, uh, the manometric abnormality. But I'm not sure any EJ outflow obstruction. Now, if I do a pneumatic dilation, I might miss my chance to get to have that diagnosis of echolasia in, in six to twelve months, because then you will you may never have that increased IRP in time, uh, in combination with um, the absent contractility. So then I'd rather gain some time with Botox or just a um, conservative approach. And then if I see achalasia, I, I can consult them for pneumatic dilation, but also uh, poem or um, Hellas Mail to me. Yeah, uh, you know, my answer to that, I agree with you, is um, less invasive, better, based on really uh, that excellent um, slide you had about the disconnect between symptom and manometric finding. And sometimes we don't want to treat manometry, we want to treat the patient. So I think the less aggressive, the better. Obviously, sometimes you go from least aggressive, then you have to progress. But um, I agree with your comment, Ariane. What about yeah, let's let's um, let's and also for the following reason. Let's say you have a patient with a functional chest pain or chest pain because of functional calls, and then then an IRP of twenty, slightly increased. So you have a diagnosis of EGI outflow obstruction and chest pain, but it's functional. But you don't know if that's functional yet. Yeah. So if you then do a pneumatic dilation, they won't respond. That's it's like unlikely for them to respond. Then what's your next step? Are you going to do a, a myotomy then? Yeah. And then, and then this is a patient with functional uh, symptoms, so they'll have all the complications of the myotomy. They'll have the reflux, uh, more chest pain, and and you end up and you you have lost your chance to to get your final diagnosis. You can never go back anymore. Yeah, I think this is really important, and I want to emphasize what you just said, Arjan, to the group listening, is sometimes we read about some people advocating POEM or myotomy or pneumatic dilation for some of these disorders, but really caution, cautious approach would be at least what you're hearing from us, uh, from the panel here, that you know, be cautious about some of these, make sure symptoms correlate, make sure there's obstruction on this, um, what about the role of um, peppermint, uh, antispasmodics, uh, <clears throat> hydrocyamine in spasm? Ariane, do you use that? And then Dan, if you could follow up with that, do you use um, antispasmodics in spasm, in diffuse esophageal spasm? Um, well, well not a, I don't use peppermint oil, but um, I, I don't, I can't recall if there's any, any studies on it, but I may have missed something, but we, we generally stick to the nitrates, the calcium blockers. If that doesn't work, we'll, we'll uh, step to the Botox. But we're curious to hear what Patel, uh, Dan thinks. Yeah, I think uh, that's great. I think there's very uh, uh, poor quality studies in terms of peppermint oil uh, looking at spasm. And there's actually no studies looking at hyoscyamine uh, in esophageal spasm. But of course, it's a smooth muscle relaxer. Uh, we've used anecdotally in clinic because we think it has a less uh, risk uh, profile compared to calcium channel blocker and nitrates in terms of not developing hypotension and headaches and all of that stuff. So we've used it in people with chest pain as a primary complaint in esophageal spasm, but really the evidence is not there in terms of studies. And really there's only, I think, one case report about sublingual hyoscyamine in someone with jackhammer that showed decreased amplitude but it's N of one <laughs> in literature. Yeah, that's right. Sometimes we're forced to use what we have. And I think the points you're raising uh, is that there, there are just not enough data to suggest um, 
whether or not they help or not. At least we don't have that data. What about Globus? There's a question about Globus. If someone presents with Globus as the symptom, should we do high resolution manometry in that patient? The yield is, is very low. I agree. Dan, you agree with Dan? Yeah, yeah, I, com I completely agree. I think the chances that it is uh, functional and, and nerve related is much more higher and with Globus sensation. So. I think motility abnormality is unlikely with that symptom. Yeah, the other thing is, you know, we've gotten into this idea that if esophagus looks normal, biopsy, and, you know, I, I don't know where you guys stand on that. I know, speaking for myself, I biopsy if I see something and if I suspect something. So one of the questions comes up is, uh, with hypercontractile esophagus, is there a role for EGJ biopsy, particularly if EOE, to rule out EOE, um, eosinophils, as a potential contributing factor. Dan, uh, I'll start with you. Do you biopsy just based on the hypercontractile state or do you biopsy based on endoscopic or clinical suspicion? Yeah, I, I don't uh, just if they have a hypercontractile esophagus. Um, now, of course, if this is someone who is a young Caucasian male who has dysphagia and you're thinking your pretest probability of EOE is higher than you might consider it, but even in that population, you should be majority of the time be able to see kind of rings, furrows, edema, some signs in the esophagus um, to, to biopsy it. But I think you don't necessarily need to just because they have spasm or hypercontractility. Yeah, Aryan, what about you? Do you biopsy? Yeah, well, generally they have the, the endoscopy first before they, they have the monometry. And, and so if there's a, a patient with dysphagia, I always take biopsies, whether I see something or not. I see. Are you finding things in those usually when you do biopsy? The yield is low, but yeah. I think that that I'm trained to see to recognize EOE, but some people are might be less trained to recognize EOE. And then I think it, it is in general a good recommendation to biopsy if you have a patient with dysphagia. And finally, this question about the role of uh, diet, um, weight loss. Um, uh, so. Do we emphasize that? I know we do that for GERD. Any recommendations on either hypo or hypercontractile states? Do we emphasize diet, if not solely for GERD purposes, but for the hyper or hypo contractile motility purposes? Um, well, generally, in, in most patients with absence contractility, the dysphagia is often not a predominant symptom, particularly in the scleroderma patient. It's, Generally, they complain of reflux, not dysphagia. So then the diet is not really an issue. Right. Um, and uh, I said final. I always have one more than the final question. <laughs> um, it, it, this is a good one because sometimes I get patients that are referred that endoscopically someone suspect motility disorder. Do you guys rely on that? How good is endoscopy in telling you someone has motility disorder? I'll start with you, Ariane, and then Dan, if you could finish with that. It's completely unreliable. <laughs> yeah, I think I think that's uh, that's very very true. Now I think uh, it uh, has some utility in someone who does esophageal endoscopy all the time. Uh, and really, the only thing sometimes you might be able to detect is well, was there retained liquid in the esophagus? Is the lumen dilated? Is there a hypertonic LES? Yeah. You feel a little bit of resistance going through it. But again, um, if it looks like a normal caliber esophagus, then someone commenting that it's a patulous LES is, or hypertonic is kind of unreliable. Yeah, I agree. Well, we'll have to end it there. Well, I hope everyone enjoyed this. Dan, Aryan, thank you so much for um, being a part of this presentation and educating us on this. For, the, for those that are listening, uh, there will be recordings that will be made available in the next week or so. As well, there'll be a survey that will be coming to you. Please fill that out and give us comments so that we can improve on this as well any topics that you would be of interest for future lectures that we can put together. Again, thank you everyone and have a good day.